Hi guys, Brie Cheyenne checking in. Welcome back to my channel if you're welcoming back. And if you're new here, then welcome to my channel where we talk about all things crime, mysterious, and things that are just creepy. So if that sounds like what you like or if that sounds like something you might like, then hopefully you enjoy my videos. So today's video is gonna be a little bit of a different one than my normal like unsolved cold cases or like soft cold cases and things like that. Today's video is going to be about Law & Order SVU actually, which is one of my favorite shows in this entire world. It is one of the only shows I've seen a billion times. I watched like the first 12 seasons at least seven times when it was on Netflix. So sad that they took it off, but I, I love the show. So if you like that show, then we can definitely, we are, we're connected, we are already one. <laughs> In today's video, we're going to be talking about five Law & Order SVU cases that were inspired by real life crimes. Some of these you probably already know. Um, you probably already know a couple that I'm going to mention, but some of these I didn't hear about that I learned while I was researching. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. I'm going to stop babbling on. And as always, we like short and sweet intros. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right into the video for you guys. <laughs> So first up, we have episode 11 from season three called Monogamy. In this episode, a woman that is seven months pregnant is savagely attacked and her baby is ripped right from her womb. Now the real life crime, a woman named Lisa Montgomery met a woman named Bobby Jo Stinnett on an online chat room called Ratter Chatter, which was a rat terrier chat room. Lisa did not use her real name though. She used an alias Darlene Fisher. Bobby Jo Stinnett was born on December 4th, 1981, making her 23 years old at the time of her death. She was eight months pregnant with her first child and she ran a dog breeding business with her husband outside of her home. Lisa Montgomery was born on February 27th, 1968, and she was living in Melbourne, Kansas at the time of her arrest. She grew up in a really abusive of household that she tried to marry out of which actually just resulted in her being in abusive relationships. She had four children of her own until 1990 where her husband said she then had tubal ligation. He also said she falsely claimed to be pregnant several times after she had the procedure done. While corresponding with Bobby, this is a lie Lisa told her too. So believing that Lisa was also pregnant, Bobby and Lisa were exchanging emails and corresponding about their pregnancies. Well, Bobby about hers and Lisa about her not pregnancy. The two had also met in person before so they were familiar with each other. That's also presumably why um, Lisa didn't use her real name, why she was using the alias Darlene. Under the pretense that Lisa was buying a dog, Bobby arranged to meet Lisa thinking that she's this Darlene person on December 16th, 2004. On December 16th, 2004, Bobby Joe's mother found her murdered about an hour after she had been attacked in her home. Bobby Joe's mother said that her injuries appeared as if her stomach had exploded because her fetus had been cut from her womb. Paramedics arrived on the scene and they attempted to resuscitate her on the scene, but they were unsuccessful and she was pronounced dead at St. Francis Hospital in Maryville, Missouri. Investigators quickly discovered the online communications between Darlene and Bobby Joe, which led them to Lisa's house the very next day they arrested her and they also found the day old newborn who Lisa was claiming to be her baby to all of her family and friends. DNA testing did confirm that the day old newborn since named Victoria Jo Stinnett was Bobby Joe's daughter and she has since been reunited with her father Zeb. Four days after Bobby Joe's murder, Lisa was charged with kidnapping resulting in death, which is a federal offense and she was convicted of this charge in October of 2007. Four days after her conviction, a jury recommended a death sentence, which was imposed by a judge, Gary A. Ferner, and was upheld by another judge on April 4th of 2008. The jury sent a clear message in their verdict form that while they believe Montgomery was physically, mentally, and sexually abused as a child, she is still totally responsible for the crimes she committed. This case has finally come to a close, but we will never stop missing Bobby Jo. She was a sweet, and loving wife, daughter, and sister, and would have been a wonderful mother. She is currently on death row at Federal Medical Center Carswell in Fort Worth, Texas. In episode six of season 16 named Glasgow Man's, <laughs> Glasgow Man's Wrath, Three young girls were having a sleepover and they decided to make their way into the woods to find 
Glasgow Man, which was a fictional character created by one of the girls' babysitter. The next day, one of the girls ended up in the hospital with stab wounds and a serious head injury. This episode was directly pulled from the Slender Man killings. I'm sure you guys all know what Slender Man is. Man, I remember that back when I was in middle school. It was, everyone was so creeped out by it, but I honestly didn't find it that creepy. I was like, it's not, I feel like everyone was just exaggerating just a little bit. If you don't know who Slender Man is, he is a fictional entity that was created by a user on a forum called Something Awful. It has since grown massively in popularity, expanding into games, fan fiction, and even a movie. On May 31st, 2014 in Wakanda, Wisconsin, two classmates, Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser, lured their classmate, who was also their best friend, Peyton Laudner, into the woods when they were having a sleepover. Anissa and Morgan learned about Slender Man through a website called Creepypasta Wiki. They claimed that they believed Slender Man was real and they wanted to prove their loyalty to him in order to become his proxies. They believed that the only way to do this was to kill someone so that they could prevent him from harming their families and so that they could also live in his mansion. During a game of hide and seek on May 31st, 2014, Peyton was held down and stabbed 19 times with a kitchen knife two of the wounds being to major organs. Anissa told Peyton to lie down because the blood would come out slower. They told her that they were going to go get help for her, but they weren't going to go do that. They just left. It's in Waukesha, like what bad stuff happens in Waukesha, Wisconsin? Peyton was stabbed 19 times and left for dead by her own friends, who later blamed the fictional character, Slender Man. Morgan handed me the knife and then I started to count again. When I was five feet away, I said, now, go ballistic, go crazy, stab, 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 stab. The suspect lured the victim into the woods. All three of the girls are 12 years old. The whole time, Peyton was screaming in agony. I didn't want to do this. I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't. Peyton was able to crawl to a nearby road where she was found by a cyclist. She was transported to the hospital and fortunately she recovered from her wounds after about a week and she was able to return to school. Anissa and Morgan were later apprehended where they were found carrying the knife that they used inside the bag that they were carrying. Morgan was described as feeling no remorse for what she did. Anissa, however, did feel guilty, but she believed that she was doing it for Slender Man because she believed he was real. In 2017, Anissa pled guilty to being a party to attempted second degree murder. A jury later found her not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. She was sentenced to 25 years to life, an intermediate sentence which involved at least three years of locked confinement and involuntary treatment at a psychiatric institute, followed by communal supervision up until 37 years old. Morgan accepted a plea deal under the conditions that she would not go to trial and also she would undergo psychiatric evaluations in order to determine how long she would need to be placed in a psychiatric institution. She pled guilty and she was also found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Morgan was sentenced to 40 years to life, the maximum, which involved at least three years locked confinement in addition to involuntary treatment at a psychiatric institution until complete resolution of her symptoms or until she's 53, whichever one happens first, followed by continued communal supervision. She will also be periodically evaluated in order to see if she needs any further treatment. And in 2018, Morgan was sentenced to 40 years under mental health facility supervision. Season 6, Episode 4 called Scavenger, the SVU squad is being taunted by a serial killer calling himself RDK, who leaves puzzles around the city for the SVU squad to solve who he is and also who his next victims are. This was a clear reference to a serial killer who called himself BTK, which stood for Bind, Torture, and Kill, what he did to his victims, who murdered 10 people in Wichita, Kansas between 1974 and 1991. He calls himself the BTK Strangler and promises to kill again. BTK's brutal crimes shocked Wichita. The most infamous unsolved serial killing spree in Wichita history. BTK stood for bind, torture, kill, and that was his M.O. 
This serial killer went unidentified until 2005. During his murder sprees, BTK sent taunting letters to the police and media outlets, but he completely stopped communications up until 2005 when he started up again. Then police were able to finally identify BTK as a man named Dennis Rader. Raider's first victims were four members of the Otero family, the father, Joseph, the mother, Jolie, the son, Joseph Jr., and also their daughter, Josephine. The family's eldest child, Charlie, who was 15 at the time, was at school when the murders took place, and he came home to find his family's lifeless bodies on January 15, 1974. Raider confessed to killing the Otero family after his arrest in 2005. He also wrote a letter detailing his crime in October of 1978 and stashed it in a book in a Wichita library. Growing up, Raider had a deviated sense of sexuality. He found pleasure in binding his own ankles and wrists and also covering his head with a plastic bag, a method he came to use on his victims. He also derived pleasure from torturing animals. In an interview done by psychologist Robert Mendoza after Raider's arrest, he diagnosed him with antisocial, narcissistic, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Three months after killing the Otero family members, Raider struck again at killing 21-year-old Catherine Bright. He almost killed her 19-year-old brother as well, shooting him two times in his head when he attempted to flee. He went off the radar when he found out that his wife Paula was pregnant with their first child, a situation he kind of described as a semblance of normalcy. He felt that he was somewhat normal because he was excited about having a child and, you know, if he was this messed up person he wouldn't be having these feelings about being excited about having a child and you know having a family. Raider would eventually grow restless years later and he struck again in March of 1977 killing 24 year old Shirley Vian. At the time Raider and his wife were expecting their second child a daughter they later named Carrie. Raider murdered 25 year old Nancy Fox in December of 1977. The following year in 1978 he sent a letter to a news outlet by the name of Cake, taking credit for the Otero murders. In this, he also gave himself the name that stuck, BTK. In this letter, he also claimed that he was driven by Factor X to kill, which was something he described as a supernatural element that just drove him and also other serial killers to kill. Raider again took a years long hiatus after the birth of his second child. He struck again in April of 1985, murdering 53 year old grandmother and widow Maureen Hedge while he was on a Cub Scout trip with his son. He later told police that he snuck away to commit the murder to return by the morning. He took a couple more hiatuses before murdering his ninth victim, 28-year-old Vicki Weggerly, in September of 1987 and murdering his 10th and final victim, 62-year-old Dolores Davis, in January of 1991. In 2004, the Wichita Eagle decided to commemorate the then still unsolved murders of the Otero family in this article, they made one line mention of the, the absence of this serial killer's legacy. And this prompted Raider to start up communications again because he was just mad that he wasn't getting the credit that he, he thought he deserved. In March of 2004, the Wichita Eagle received a letter from a Bill Thomas Kilman, obviously a reference to BTK, taking credit for the Vicki Weggerly murder. He also included photos of the crime scene and a photocopy of her driver's license which had been stolen at the time of her murder. At the time, the police weren't sure if she was definitely one of his victims, but he confirmed it with this letter. Raider then spent the next few months leaving packages and letters, like not even just to the police. He was leaving them all over town, like he put one in a mailbox, put some one in someone's car. He was just doing a lot of stuff. just doing the most. His arrest would come about when he asked the police if it would be safe to send a floppy disk, meaning would the police be able to trace it if he sent it. The police replied in a newspaper telling him that it would be okay if he sent one. That was such a dumb thing to do. Did he think they were going to be like, no, we're not going to be able to trace it. Like, like obviously they were going to if they can and tell you that they couldn't just so they could. <laughs> Raider stupidly thinking that the police were telling the truth, he sent them a floppy disk. Unbeknownst to Raider, there was still a document that was deleted but was still stored and able to be found on the floppy disk. In this document, they found the words Christ Lutheran Church and they found that it was last modified by a 
a dentist. A quick Google search led them to Dennis Rader because he was the president of the church council. The police knew that BTK drove a black Jeep Cherokee and when they went to Dennis Rader's house, they saw in his driveway a black Jeep Cherokee. This evidence was only circumstantial, so in order to directly link Dennis as BTK, they decided to use a pap smear that his daughter Carrie got when she was a student at Kansas State University and compare that DNA to DNA found at one of the crime scenes. When they compared the DNA, they found that it was a familiar match. With this match, they then arrested Dennis Rader. It's been more than a decade since your life as you knew it changed forever. What do you remember about that day? It was a normal day. I had slept in. I was substitute teaching and I would just took the day off and then there's a knock on my door. So I'm already thinking like, who's this person, you know, in, in my apartment building? And then he said he was the FBI. Is there any reason you should even expect the FBI no, to be at your home? No, What does he say exactly? He asked, do you know who BTK is? I was like, you mean the person that's wanted for murders back in Kansas? And then he says, your dad has been arrested as BTK. And I was like, I think I'm gonna pass out. In 2005, Rader was charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. He is currently in prison at El Dorado Correctional Facility, where he stays mostly in solitary confinement for his own safety. On February 25th, 2005, um, when I found out my father was arrested, his place became not my home and no one ever slept in my house again. In season 16, episode 8, Spousal Privilege, the detectives discover security cam footage of a famous sportscaster having a physical altercation with his girlfriend. In this footage, the sportscaster is seen hitting his girlfriend, knocking her unconscious, and carrying her body to the car. This episode was inspired by the Ray Rice scandal in 2014. Both Ray Rice and his then fiance, now wife, Janae Palmer, were arrested for assault after an altercation at a casino. Five days later, on February 19th, TMZ released a video that showed Ray Rice dragging Janae's unconscious body out of the elevator, which was caused by him striking her in the head. Ray Rice was indicted by a grand jury for third degree assault in March of 2014. He faced a possible sentence of three to five years and a fine of up to $15,000. Ray Rice and Janae wed one day after the indictment, which was about a month and a half after the altercation. The charges were later dropped after Rice agreed to complete court supervised counseling. He was also suspended for the first two games of the 2014 NFL season. He was later terminated by the Ravens and he settled a wrongful termination claim with them. He was also suspended indefinitely by the league, which was later overturned in federal courts. However, he hasn't since played since his release from the Ravens in 2013. <laughs> Season 21, episode one called I'm Going to Make You a Star, a Harvey Weinstein situation kicks off in which a Sir Tobias Moore, who's head of a large studio and streaming service, sexually assaults a young actress during an audition. An investigation done by the squad reveals that this wasn't his first time. This episode was actually directly written by one of the attorneys involved in the Weinstein case. On October 5th, 2017, the New York Times broke the first reports of decades of sexual misconduct claims against film producer Harvey Weinstein. Over 80 women have since come forward accusing Weinstein of sexual misconduct of some form. He has said that they were all consensual. Line ass. Sorry. Harvey Weinstein. More than 90 women, including McGowan, have come forward to accuse the once powerful movie mogul of acts ranging from sexual misconduct to rape. This is an international rapist, okay? This is the truth of what it is. This is an international rape factory. Every single place he ever stayed, there were people there set up to help him rape. This is how it went. This is what it was. People, women, girls would be said, oh, you have a meeting or come to a party, they would show up and that party is just him. Who, who got them there? Who are the assistants? You're saying there was a machinery. So I'm saying there's a massive machinery. He is a sociopathic predator. 
The wave of accusers that came forward brought about, which I'm sure you know, the Me Too movement, which encourages people of sexual assault to share their stories. This also caused what is called the Weinstein effect, in which allegations of sexual misconduct by famous or powerful men are disclosed. In July of 2016, Fox Television News host Gretchen Carlson filed a suit against the station's chairman, Roger Ailes, which led to his removal. Allegations have even been made in politics against members of Congress, including John Conyers and Al Franken both of whom have resigned their seats in Congress. Weinstein was arrested by New York police and charged with rape, criminal sex act, sex abuse, and sexual misconduct involving two separate women in May of 2018. He posted bail. When his trial began, he was charged with raping another woman and sexually assaulting another in Los Angeles. A jury convicted Weinstein in February 2020 of one count of criminal sexual assault in the first degree and also one count of rape in the third degree. He was remanded to jail at Rikers Island pending sentencing in March where he was sentenced to 23 years. He is still currently waiting to face his trial in Los Angeles. Okay guys, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you like Law & Order. If you don't watch Law & Order, you definitely need to get on Law & Order. It really is so addictive. It's so good. I put like so many people on that show. It's crazy how many people don't know that show. Most people do. Thankfully, a lot of people have taste. But I do run into the few people every once in a while and I put it on from them and they're like, this is so good. And I'm like, right? <laughs> but hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and hopefully you'll be back for more. Thanks for staying this long if you did. Bye.